and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and we are back with another insect sketch along. Um, we are looking at a stone fly. Hi, Hashi. Hi, um, Susan. It is nice to see that you're here and hanging out with us today. Um, Hashi, I did get your email asking if I had a centipede. Um, unfortunately, I do not have a centipede in my collection. I was trying to think, I may have a centipede in ethanol in one of my older drawers, but I would have to look for it. Um, I don't have any pinned specimens of centipedes. Centipedes are difficult for a couple of reasons. One, their body, their, their, um, their exoskeleton isn't as hard, so when they pass away, you almost have to keep them in ethanol. Um, just like spiders, they don't really do well pinned because of how the muscles are inside of their body. Um, but also, when they pass away, they are... They have so many legs, they lose legs, and like their body kind of collapses a little bit because they're so soft. So when they dry out, it's hard to keep them looking good. Um, and for those reasons, I don't have a centipede in my collection, but I understand that when we're out and about and looking at buggies and stuff, sometimes... Um, it's just good to have them. So I might go out and see if I can collect a centipede for you guys. If it is freshly, if I collect it fresh, then at least we can put it under the microscope and sketch it together, whether or not I was going to um, pin it and put it in my collection. So, very good. Um, we are talking about stoneflies today. Um, there's a couple of different views of a stonefly that can be kind of cool. I wanted to start by showing you ladies and gentlemen how flat they are. Look how flat it is. So stoneflies are, um, I guess we would call this laterally, um, laterally very flat. Um, naturally a stonefly when it's a naiad or an immature that lives underwater, um, the, uh, they're gonna be holding on to a rock, and there's this wonderful place, um, if you are in a river, and you've got this big rock, and there's really fast water flowing over it, if you look really close to, like, the barrier in between the rock and the really fast water, there is some crazy rule in science um, about friction that creates a little barrier between the rock and the really fast moving water, where the water that's going by the rock is really, really slower, is slower. Um, and so the stoneflies are super, super flat, so they can stay glued to those rocks, and they can exist in that border, in that border fringe, where friction is actually keeping the water from blowing them away. Um, so that's kind of cool. Oh, there's a mouse here? I don't have a mouse. Do you have a mouse? Oh. I guess you need your, your kitties to go and find it. Yes, I um I personally love when insects when you can talk about like other heavy sciences like physics and chemistry when you're talking about insects because I love where the sciences kind of overlap. Um, so where I where I have knowledge and where I know, I'll always kind of share bonus factoids about how um about how they work around, how they work in the world. So Hashi has uh, house centipedes, but I haven't seen a house centipede in the house for a while, or I would have collected one recently. Um, but I think I can go outside and get a, um, a, they call them stone centipedes, the centipedes that are red um, that you find under rocks and stuff. 
So this is my stonefly, what it looks like dorsally. Now something that we'll, oh, I'm going to be going over our insect and kind of turning it and talking a little bit about it before we start sketching it. Because, you know, things. So, um, this, oops, Terry, grabbing my other screen. All right, there we go. So, um, these legs here, um, a lot of times when we are sketching our middle legs, our front legs go forward and the middle legs go backward and the hind legs also go backward, right? So normally the middle legs are going backwards. In stone flies, it's just a little bit different. The middle legs go forwards. It, it makes them look kind of funny. Um, at least I think it makes them look kind of funny because all of their legs are pointing forward like that, but it does actually help them stay lower to the, the substrate that they're sitting on so that they can stay as flat as possible. Although when they're adults, they're not living underwater. When they're adults, they are fully terrestrial and they are flying around. Although they're not really great flyers. If you've ever seen... Uh, I was having a hard time explaining their flight to kids, but um, they flutter a lot. Like, they have, they spend a lot of energy fluttering their wings, but they don't move forward very quickly. They kind of just move up and down in the air, um, and then eventually they kind of go forward. But they're really, really kind of poor flyers, the ones that I've seen fly. Dr. Adrian Slith just put out a video about millipedes. Ooh, maybe I'll have to check that out. Now, the other view that I wanted us to get before we started sketching was a head-on view. Because I know that there are a couple of you... that like Oselli. So this is our head-on view for our stonefly. And as you can see here, our stonefly does have two compound eyes. They also have three simple eyes. Um, <clears throat> and we are looking at these maxillary palps and the labial palps underneath. So those are the mouth fingers that help them eat. Now, there's also this really interesting suture, and I'm not sure what we would call this, but it's like a little wavy line, and it makes the face look like it was put together like a puzzle, and I think that that's kind of fun. Um, and if you're looking here, this is the scape, or the first segment of the antenna, and the second segment of the antenna is right about here. It's still in focus. It's a little bit wider, and it's kind of shiny here. And then after that, you have the flagellum, and these antenna are super duper long, so there's lots and lots of segments, and nobody really ever counts them. Once you get to a certain point, um, once you get to so many segments, even scientists don't want to count them. So then they end up comparing the length of the antenna to something like the length of the body. Um, and that's how a lot of times with these types of antenna where you're not going to count the segments, that's how they use the antenna in keys. It looks like a mustache. Aww. That's cute. Yeah. Just like a little line there. So that's that's kind of fun. My stoneflies do have chewing mouth parts. They do chew and swallow their food. If, if they eat as adults, they eat plant material, moss, or lichen. Um, many stoneflies, after they become adults, they no longer eat. Um, stoneflies... I'm not sure the exact species on this on this stonefly. In fact, I'm not even sure if I know the family of this stonefly because stoneflies are their own order of insects. Just like beetles is an order, bees, wasps, and ants all together, that's an order. Butterflies and moths is an order. Stoneflies all by themselves, they're unique enough that they get their own order. And we call them Plecoptera.
And I have since, I think I, I feel like I used to know what Pleco meant, but I have since not. So let's see, Pleco from to plate or weave. So ple Plecoptera would break down into Pleco and Terra. Terra meaning wi wings, and Pleco actually means weave. So let's go on and check out, we're going to turn our specimen just a little bit and we're going to check out the wings of our stonefly so that you can tell me if you think that the wings are woven. Morning chaos. Uh, that's just like stamens on flowers. Botanins are like two, three, four, five. And then we just stop counting. I love that. Many and lots. <laughs> so we are going to be focusing down here on the wings. And my guess is that when they're saying woven or weave wings, My guess is they are making a reference to the venation on the wings. So that's a, that's a close up of our wings. Um, as you can see, our stonefly's wings are significantly longer than the body. The abdomen actually stops right about here. Um, it does have two tails, one and two. They're kind of crossing each other there, kind of through. If you look through the wings, you can kind of see the darker spots. That's the abdomen, that's the body. And then the rest, the wings are actually pretty long. And this is as far out as I can zoom on my microscope. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take our friend here and I'm gonna freeze the image maybe about here. I might zoom in a little bit, see if we can get more light. Or the program to, there we go. <laughs> All right, so we've got our stonefly over here underneath our desk camera. I'll go ahead and turn that light on so that you can see. And my ruler walked away. My ruler is, oh, there it is. Got it. Like, oh, you, it's funny because it's imaginary ruler. You can't even see it, but I promise it exists. It's just green. <laughs> All right. So our specimen is about 2.8 or 2.9 centimeters. Yeah. Probably about 2.8 centimeters long from the front of the head to the back of the wings. Um, if this is helpful, oops, if this is helpful, I can give you this image here so that you can take a screenshot of our friend um, so that you can get a whole body image. That's actually a pretty cool shot of our stonefly. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so we're looking at up here, we are looking at the head, the, the pronotum here, the connection to the wings and the legs. We would call these antenna filiform antenna. Oh, that's all right, Chaos. I did notice that you were gone, but I figured you were just really busy. I understand I get really busy sometimes. Are fish flies in the same order or different? Fish flies are in a different order. And that's um and that's a good eye. They do look pretty similar. Um, but stoneflies are their own order, and fishflies and dobson flies are in the 
order. I believe they're Neuropterans. No, they're Megaloptera. Did they used to be considered Neuropterans? No, they're just closely related to Neuropterans. Huh. Yeah, so, um, a uh, long story short, I just went down a little bit of a, a little bit of a, uh, um, uh, a taxonomy hole. But, yes, um, fish flies are in the order Megaloptera, and, um, stone flies are in the order Plecoptera. Yes, the wings overlap. Um, so if we are looking here, the wings of the left side are on top of the wings on the right side. So right about, oh, come on. So right about here, this wing curls over and is on top. One of the characteristic features when you're trying to identify a stonefly versus um, other closely related insects like caddisflies um, is the wing position. So stoneflies leave their wings flat on top of each other like this, and caddisflies, Sammy, down. She's Sammy. Sammy's like, you can't help me because you're on live stream. I'm going to go grab my cat really quick. You're not allowed to be climbing in the ceiling. This is Sammy. She's going to make a quick appearance. She's not happy that I picked her up. She's not allowed in the ceiling, and sometimes she likes to go there. Okay. All right, so um, that's our stonefly. I hope I gave you enough time to take a picture of its size. Um, so let's go ahead and get some sketching done. The top wing is attached on the left. All right, stoneflies are in the order Plecoptera. And stoneflies are the only thing in this order, although there are a variety of different types of of different types of stoneflies. The, um, the nymphs can have different jobs in aquatic situations where they can be um, predatory. They can be eating other insects. They can be grazers where they're walking along the rocks and kind of grazing the uh, stuff that grows, the algae and stuff that grows on the rocks. Or they can be shredders where they're eating um, big pieces of leaves and breaking them down into smaller pieces of leaves. Um, if you were in an aquatic situation and you were going to collect, um, finding stoneflies, which are these guys here with two tails, uh, is an indicator of good, of healthy water. All right, um, I'm actually going to start my sketch by just giving the outline of the, by just giving the outline of the head, the pronotum, and the wings, I believe. Um, and I'm going to do it kind of quick. This is mostly for my, um, for the size of my stonefly here, right? So I want to make sure that <laughs> when I start sketching it, I don't, um, a lot of times I'll make the head too large and then as I'm going through and using that same body ratio, I will end up with an insect that's way too big for the paper. So um, I like to give myself just a light outline to make sure that I'm going to stay on the paper. So we've got a head situation going on. Um, my really light sketch, I'm just going to give it parentheses and break it off at the top. Um, 
we've got this pronotum here. That's the first seg segment of our thorax. And then um, you, you do have two more segments of the thorax, one and two. You just can't see them as much underneath the wings. The um, left wing is the one that's on top, and it comes around... So it looks like I will just barely have enough room, which is great. And then I'm going to take this second wing where really the, as much as you can see is the wing that goes underneath. And then it kind of, it, get, it gets completely overlapped by the wing on the left. So as long as you kind of finish that off, that'll, that'll work well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the front legs go forward, but so do the middle legs. I'm not, I don't like how that one went, so I'm going to fix that one. Let's see. I'm going to put it out just a little bit. All right, so we've got our front legs and our middle legs, and our hind legs are going to be coming out in this region, and they are actually fairly long, but a lot of times our hind legs, they um, aren't really visible dorsally. They're not regularly visible. But that's okay. We can sketch them this way, um, as if the legs were kind of spread out just a little bit. And then to see the hind legs, we're probably going to have to flip the specimen completely over. But um, I planned to do that anyway, because um, stoneflies, when they are nymphs... Um, all right, so I'll start and this conversation. So these are a, they have a simple metamorphosis. So they go egg, nymph, and then adult. But because they are aquatic, they, and the immature stage is underwater and the adult stage is terrestrial, um, we call the nymphs, we actually call them naiads instead of nymphs. Um, but anyone, if you said nymphs, nymphs to anybody, they would understand. It's just that the more, I guess the proper term is naiads. Oh, and naiad is spelled like this. N-A-I-A-D. Naiad. All right. Um... Oh, yes, I was zooming in on the head so like we could start sketching detailed features of the head. Um, the head kind of points down a little bit, and so I have to turn the specimen a little bit more towards us so that we can see the entire features of the head. But I like it when my dorsal images kind of show this entire, like, the frontal region of the head. So we're just going to sketch it like our friend was looking up and oh my goodness from this look from this image it totally does look like a cute smiley face so all right one of my students earlier mentioned that it looks like you had a smiley face because this and this those are your ocelli those are the simple eyes and then you have a suture here that's kind of rounded and it looks like a smile but you know what right now even this line that's right here that's that suture in between the head and kind of like the start of the mouth parts um it looks like those could be like angry eyebrows <laughs> I love it. I love it a lot. Alrighty. So, looking at the head, obviously, we are going to be changing a lot of these features. So, oh, I just threw my... Oh, no! to the abyss. Um, so you know how uh, 
if you're in your car, that space in between, like, your seat and your uh, seat belt, where there's that little space where things drop and then you never find them. I have a similar space in between my desk and my insect cabinet where things drop down there and then they disappear in the abyss and they're never to be found again. And my eraser went down there, like, the inside of it. So, I have a refill here, but I'm going to have to dig into it now so that I can go and get it back. Oh... Alrighty. So I have an uh, estimate on how large I want my head to be. The um, the exoskeleton or the uh, the sclerite that comes up behind the eye kind of does cover a little bit of the eye there. Oh man, he's so cute. I love him so much. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start with the edge of my head here. Yeah. Um, and then the exoskeleton kind of comes up a little bit. I'm leaving a notch for the eye, and then I'm just going to kind of fill that out. So we've got notches for our compound eyes, and then we come in towards the center, and over. Cool. All right, so that's going to be our overall shape. Obviously, try to keep, keep it symmetrical. Our friend here likes to have very symmetrical features, as many of you know. So we've got those. Um, I'm going to come out and round out our compound eyes here so that they are circular, and I'm going to go ahead and cross-hatch inside of them because that brings our buggy to life. There we go. All right, we also have three ocelli. The ocelli, let's see, we've got, I actually do, I'm going to go ahead and add that suture that's here. Um, then we have an ocelli at either side. And then one more ocelli that is up and central so that they make this triangle. And then from about here, underneath the eye, we have that wavy suture line that comes up and down and meets it central at this ocelli and then goes up and down one more time and then disappears. So you've got this kind of happening on your head. Um, then we have our antennal segment. So um, as you know, we have a scape, a pedestal, and a flagellum. Flagellum. Doop, 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 doop. So the scape is that really thick part that is that almost looks like the base of the antenna. It's that first segment. Comes out like this. And then the pedestal is that next one that looks like it still has some sustenance. It's still a little larger than all of the other ones, but it's smaller than the scape. So it's kind of like that middle ground. Pencil change. All right, so we've got the scape, we have the pedestal, and then I'm actually going to leave the flagellum until later because I want, I'm thinking I'm going to bring my antenna kind of back over the body, um, and that means it's going to be going over the legs, and so I'm going to, I want to sketch the legs first and then come back for the antenna. Oh, hey, wait a minute. The eye is supposed to come out to here. So stoneflies are an indicator of healthy water.
water. So if you were out and about and you were collecting aquatic insects for some benthic biomonitoring and you wanted to determine the water quality or the health of your river, river or stream, um, finding stoneflies is a good sign. Finding a variety of different kinds of stoneflies is an even better sign. Um, they're very, we call them highly sensitive. They're sensitive to pollutants and, um, and chemis chemicals in the water. So if you have high pollution, highly polluted water, or there's a whole bunch of chemicals that aren't supposed to be there, our stoneflies will start passing away. And, um, and so that's why they're such an indicator of good, healthy water. Now, stoneflies also, when they're naiads, when they're immatures, they have gills. They have gills to breathe. And their gills, rather than being off of the sides of their abdomens, like mayflies have, stoneflies have their gills at the base of each of their legs, on the bottom side of their body. So, um, I like to call them armpit gills. <laughs> they sit right here, and they're right at the bases. I believe sometimes... Um, it, when you flip over a stonefly, you can see their gill scars from when they were a nymph because as an adult, they no longer have those gills, but I believe they have some type of marking at the bases of their legs, kind of like where their gills used to be. Are the antenna especially flexible? Why so many segments? Yeah, I mean, the antenna are super incredibly flexible. Um, this is just one antenna type. We call this a... F I would call this a filiform antenna, but there is another antenna type. that I just lost the word of, that is like, instead of it being just straight, it means hair-like. Cetaceous antenna, maybe? So I would probably go back and forth with this antenna if we were actually trying to give it a word. I would either call it a filiform antenna because it's straight, or I would call it a cetaceous antenna because of how thin and long it is. When we say cetaceous antenna, we're just saying that the antenna is hair-like, um, so long and thin with lots of segments. Um, so I would go kind of between those two, or I would understand it as both. Filiform is having the form of a filament. Yes, long and thin, just like a filament. All right, so we're looking at the back or the pronotum of our insect here, of our stonefly, and there are a couple of features that we want to make sure we get in there. Yes, she's got that long um, vertical stripe down the center of her pronotum. That's kind of cool. Um, the edges are significantly more pointed than I had featured here in my, in my light outline. So what I'm going to come and do is I'm going to get these, the angles on the edges figured out, and we'll then we'll get some of this situated. So it looks like the front of the pronotum is a little bit wider than the back. So instead of having the edges be parallel, I'm just going to start a little bit outside of that line, and then I'm going to go a little bit inside of the line. So I'm giving myself that little bit of an angle, kind of using that straight line as a basis for... Um, to keep it symmetrical. Cool. All right. Now, um, I'm going to just go ahead and kind of round it out like this. But we also have another piece here. So I rounded this out, and that's this line down here. But our pronotum also has another kind of additional lip here that my head can kind of almost tuck up underneath. 
And I'm just going to, I want to make sure that we get that in there. So I'm going to bring this pronotum up and just give it a little bit of a ledge here. And then if the, if the headlines get in the way of that, you can go ahead and erase those. All right, so we're getting there. And then the, bo the bottom side is pretty pointed, very much 90 degree, but there's still a little bit of rounding happening. So you can go ahead and round those out just a little bit. And that is going to be the shape of my pronotum. And then we're going to be adding this vertical stripe here. Pronotum is spelled like this. Pro meaning the first or number one. All right, cleaned up some of my lines and we're ready to move back to the wings. I love that you can see kind of the shape of the wings. You can also see the wing venation on the first wing, but also if I was to zoom down a little bit, you can watch the focus change from the wing veins on the top all the way through to the wing veins on the bottom. And I think that that's pretty cool too. So um, the left one is the one on the top. I do believe these things right about here, I don't think that those have a name. But I would believe it. I would believe it if someone told me that these were um, somehow in connection with the muscles for the wings. That's what it looks like to me. All righty. Our wings do are separated just a little bit from our pronotum, so I'm going to make sure that I separate that out a little bit. Um, and then they are rounded down. And I'm actually pretty happy. Admittedly, I think my wings could be even longer, but um, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and do this whole shape for my wings really quick. Let's see. So all of my pencils want to run out of lead today. That's fine. All right. And then up here at the top, the base of the wings are here. The left one is over top. Um, it comes down just a little bit. And then it's not really a smooth transition like I had sketched here. It's almost more like it's a stout wing like this. It comes, it starts kind of narrow. And then... And then it kind of loops in this direction. So if you were to look at this wing kind of off of its body, there would be a stem and then it would get wide and come, come back to being narrow again. <clears throat> and then you want to do kind of the same thing on the other side where you give yourself kind of that, that sharper angle and then round it out. Ideally, where your wings meet should be on the center line. All 
All right. Wing Venation on Stoneflies. The Wing Venation is not super important as far as I know, but here's kind of the overall feel of these wings. Starting at the starting at the top, um I'll show you this. This is good. I mean, that's totally kind of how it is, but. All right, so um, the wings also wrap around the body a little bit. Um, I've had people relate this, um, relate the wings of a stonefly to somebody kind of wrapped up in a blanket because the edges of the wings kind of wrap down towards the body. Um, I think our specimen is just tilted a little bit. So you can see right about here, there's that really strong wing vein that comes all the way down and it is straight. And then we have all of these horizontal veins coming off of it. So that is the top of the wing. That's the tip of the, the, the leading edge of the wing. And we would call this one on the outside the costa, the one on the inside the subcosta. And then we have all of these cross veins in between those. Um, you would probably call it the coastal cell. Uh, I'm not sure. But it's multiple cells, so I'm not sure. Um, but that is generally kind of tucked around the edge. So really, the edge line here is not all the way out here, but it's right about here where this kind of wraps back around. And if I was going to kind of give you the wing veins inside of here, they radiate from the tip and they come back down in this. Essentially in this order, when you're up here at the top, All right, but then you've got a number of cross fans in between those. And then after that, the wing venation gets a little bit more complicated because once you get closer to the edge, they all split into Ys. So once you get closer to the edge, they're splitting into Ys in this direction and then also crossing down. So I'll show you kind of how I create this look in, in wings. Um, so these kind of just continue like this and then this one comes here. And then what you have is a, is a whole series of wing veins that come in this direction and then they cross. So you have this like change in feeling where you've got them all kind of coming in this direction, but then once you get to the center or the or the edge of the wing, you get them all coming out in this direction. So that is right about how I would sketch the wing veins on my stonefly without going through and talking about every single wing vein um, and what it looks like and what its name is. I would say that gets us a pretty close look at about what you're going to see when you're looking at a stonefly. Um, when you're identifying them, just know that their wings are flat against their body right? Um, they don't hold their wings any other way, and that will help you identify a stonefly. All right, let's get some legs. Wing venation may be not important, but it is really interesting. That's also true. 
Um, so it just depends on what insect we're looking at as to how important the wing venations are. Um, some insects, like flies, completely depend on you knowing all of the wing venations and all of the veins in their wings. Whereas stone flies, um, they're, it's not as important to know them. I know that it's likely if you were going into some genera keys or some species, down to species keys, there are probably a couple of characters in the, um, in the wings, but I, um, am not sure exactly what those are. And so our friend here just says, Plecoptera stonefly. And to get down to that feature, we don't need the veins in the wings. Um... What do the wing veins do? Are they structural? I recall you said, but then they dry out. Yes, that's exactly what they do. So um, wing venations um, are structural. They do help hold the wings out. Mostly their purpose, um, their purpose in the beginning is to help them push their body fluids through um, and then they to dry to, to expand the wing and then they dry out. So that is a characteristic that, that they also have. Um, but once they dry out, they're mostly structural. Now, a lot of times, wing venations are also um, kind of where the wing bends. If there are folds and bends in the wings, like in beetles, um, the wing venations there are also not only structural, but are also kind of the pre-made origami lines. It's like the lines that the wings fold on. Curious why some insects have so many veins with little tiny cells while others have just a few veins with very big cells. Um, I'm not sure about that one. I'm not sure what the actual purpose is between having big, big cells and little itty bitty cells. There are even some parasitoid wasps that don't have, that pretty much don't have wing venations at all. There's a parasitoid that its front wing, the only wing vein on it, it has one wing vein that comes up like this and it loops out like that. And that's the entire wing venation on the entire wing. Now all of the rest of it is empty. And so I can't imagine that that would successfully blow up and be okay, but it works. Um, and so wing venations are one of those things that are really interesting. I could continue. We could, we could talk about them for a while, but I'm not, I, I don't know how much more information I can share. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure about the net wings versus like the, uh, like dragonflies have really have so many veins in their wings. Um, dragonflies and mayflies are some of the oldest insects or the insects that evolved first. I believe dragonflies came first. And then mayflies. I thought wing venation helps when an insect needs to cool down. I'm not sure how wing the wing veins themselves would help the insect cool down. I do know in butterflies and moths, they have um, they have the uh, the scales on their wings helps them cool off because it reflects the heat from the sun um and it uh the sometimes the uh the scales on a butterfly's wings will kind of not only reflect the heat but then diffuse the heat over the wings so that it helps them stay cool um but i'm not sure how a stonefly's wings could um wing veins could help them stay cool i would have to uh i would have to look into that more I definitely know the butterflies have wing, um, wing scales that help keep them cool, though.
Yeah, it doesn't exactly, um, Susan, it doesn't seem to be connected to anything else. Like, um, these guys are not very great flyers, but they have lots of cells, whereas dragonflies are one of the best flyers, and they also still have lots of cells, right? Um, there are butterflies that can go either way. Like, the monarch does not have very many cells in its wings, but, um, gl glides beautifully. Um... I'm sure that it just has to do with how they have to dry their wings or like how they have to blow their wings up. I'm not sure of that. I guess that would be a guess. All right, so uh, we are looking at the first leg. We have the femur, we have the tibia, and I wanted to quick zoom in on those tarsal segments because I'm curious about what exactly I'm seeing here. There's the claw. There we go. So our tarsal segments... Um, we have one, two tarsal segments that are these little kind of short boxy pieces, but this one right here is more shaped like a cup, and then our third segment is nice and long and extended, and then we have the two claws, and I believe you would call this a pulvolus. Um... That's what I would call it if we were looking at a fly. I am not sure if if stoneflies have them, but that is the character that came that popped into my head. A lot of times it's the the pulvolus in a fly. Um, is a pad that exists in between the tarsal claws that helps them land and it helps them adhere to what they're walking on. It's kind of like a sticky pad in between the claws. Um, and that's what that looks like to me. Although, I w didn't know that stoneflies had them. So, it could have a completely different name because it's a different insect. And sometimes scientists do that. Sometimes entomologists say, well, it's not a pulvolus because those are all flies. This is on a stonefly, so it has to be called something different. <laughs> Yep, Susan, you're exactly right when talking about the colors of the wings and the scales. So, yes, yeah, Susan, you actually make a good point. Generally, when, when we are sketching insects, the uh, first tarsal segment is the longest one, and then they get shorter and shorter from there. Whereas, yeah, our stonefly here has two itty-bitty short segments and then a nice long one. There are a handful of insects that have this type of tarsal formula, but um, it is unique to, it is unique in that um, most insects are not like this. I'm going to go ahead and zoom out just a little bit because I want to see the entire leg for when I'm sketching mine, but I really wanted to just get that close look on the tarsal segments before I, um, before I started drawing. I wanted to make sure I knew what I was seeing. All right. Our femur starts all the way up here at the front and then comes back. And honestly, I may have made my pronotum just a little bit too long because, but that's fine. Alright, I've got my femur that comes back and it goes just a little bit over um, past where the wings start. And then we have the tibia that comes back up in the forward direction and it's probably closer to... Oh hey, that's not right. Maybe it was. All right. 
right, so this is our femur. Then we have our tibia. And then we have those three tarsal segments. One, two, and then three. With the two claws and the little pad. Cool. All right, now um, I'm going to go ahead and give our middle leg. So our middle leg is also going to kind of copy that front leg in that it's going to come back and go out. I'm going to have it go just a little bit wider than the front leg so that um, I don't have to worry about it overlapping. Kind of actually like this, how my specimen is sketch, how my specimen is keeping its leg. Um, I might go ahead and darken it just a little bit. It looks like we're overexposing her. There we go. what's the oldest flying insect and is there any living relative for that from what I've heard even though prehistoric flying relatives of dragonflies being one of the oldest were not the first I thought that the prehistoric I thought that the dragonflies were the first insect So I thought that dragonflies were our first evolved or oldest insect because of the way that their wings are situated. But I guess you might argue, I wonder how old my, I'm going to, Colum I keep thinking about Columbula. Give me two seconds while I keep looking it up. I thought I was going to find it. I don't think I'm going to find it. Um, so for me, I thought that the first flying insect was the dragonfly. Um, or at least the... The oldest insect that we still have on the planet today um, that has a relative, ooh, how do you say that, is the dragonfly. So um, dragonflies are unique in that when they're, they're wing muscles, so they emerge out of the water, they pull out their wings, they're going to, um, once their wings, uh, when they... When they're emerging from their final larval um, exoskeleton and they have their wings and they're, they're fully developed, they're, they hold their wings above their body for just a moment. And then the moment that they, are, that they start to dry, the wings kind of flick open like this and they stay flat. And they, um, so their wings stay flat like this, and then they never have the ability to close their wings over their body again. They don't have the muscles to do that. Um, and that makes them, that makes their wing type, um, the oldest wing type out there. So I do know that, but I'm not sure about what the oldest flying insect would be. I also have this. So this, this is an image of 
of what they say it was, I think it's Cale Grimata. Um, it was uh, prehistorically the first what they would call a butterfly, but I think they figured out that it was actually closer related to a caddisfly um, because its immature stage was aquatic and for a bunch of other reasons. But this is also this is also an image of a prehistoric Im of an, a prehistoric insect or um, the first butterfly. So the back legs have the same tarsal segments as the front and the middle legs. I believe so, but give me a moment while I sketch my middle legs and then um, we can, I'll flip it over so we can check it out really quick. Um, middle leg. So we have a front leg and we have a middle leg. All right. I've always wondered about this idea of the oldest living insect, the oldest, earliest plant from an evolutionarily perspective. Our modern species of dragonflies are different than those early ones. Yes, of course, they are very, very different like species, but we can divide the original dragonflies into, I believe we can divide them into Zygoptera and Anisoptera, the dragonflies and the damselflies. Maybe damselflies came later. I would have to look up ev evolutionary history. Um, they have continued to evolve and adapt. Yes. So, of course, the dragonflies um, that are of the of nowadays are adapted and much changed from the original dragonflies. For instance, the original dragonflies were like, I don't know, two feet long or something like that with a two feet wingspan. But our dragonflies nowadays definitely don't have that. I'm taking the labels off of my specimen so that I can flip it upside down and we can see the hind legs. Oh, true, true story. So you could say that dragonflies, right, dragonflies as an order, I believe are the, I do believe dragonflies are the oldest order of insects or the first order to be evolved. Whereas you, we don't have any dragonfly species still around that were around back in that day. And that's a really awesome question. I do wonder if we have any species of insects that carried over or what the oldest living species is. I do want to look... I am not seeing any gill scars. I was curious that if we were going to see those. And the answer to your question is yes. The hind tarsal segments are the same as the front and the middle. Two short ones and then a longer one. Although the longer segment on the hind legs is even longer than the ones on the front and the middle. So um, our legs overall, our hind legs overall, are probably about double the length of our front legs or our middle legs. So they're going to come out in this region, right about here. So when I was doing identification... <gasps> Sorry, guys. Someone scared me. All right. Um, when I was doing identification of stoneflies back in, like, back in labs and for classes, I, I learned how to identify the immature stage or the larval stage. And I, um, or not larval, the naiad stage. But I didn't get as much experience identifying the adults, funny enough. Um, not to family. 
so I can know these guys to order, but I, I still have a little bit of work to go with um, identifying adult stoneflies. see it from the top but I'm glad to have it out there so you can see it because of their their ability to breathe. Oh, okay. So, um, Hashi says, your specimen's legs are folding the other way, but don't they normally fold that way? So, the front leg and the middle leg go forwards. The hind leg... This one is a little bit hard to explain. So, I opened the leg up. So, on our specimen, if we were going to draw the legs just as they were, um, it would have looked... more like this, coming down, going back in, and then coming up. But then, it would be completely underneath the body. That's kind of how they're set up right now. So instead, I took this joint and I swung it all the way open this way so that now our leg looks like... Well, I drew this one backwards because I put it on the right side, but... Um... Like that. So I, I took a leg that was kind of folded on top of itself and I opened it up. It does have a joint here in the knee, so it does have the ability to bend and fold that way. Um, so this leg, um, the femur is actually about here and the tibia came back in this direction and then we had the tarsal segments but I just kind of in my head opened that tibia up so that you could see it from the top but that's kind of what I was saying is that normally you're not gonna see this um, normally you're not gonna see the hind leg from the top because they generally don't open their legs up all the way like this but you can force their legs to do this. If I had, if I had, was um, working with the legs on my specimens too when I pinned them, I definitely could have brought the leg out and made it do this. So it has the ability, but generally doesn't. Yes, when it was alive, it when it was alive, it looked like this, and then it tucked its legs in when it died. So I just pulled it out a little bit. That's exactly what it is. Better. Um. Perfect. So we've got our head, we have our legs, our wings, our pronotum. I'm pretty happy with all of those things. Um, I think we might. We need, now we need to get these antenna figured out. But before we turn him over, we're going to look at his face at this direction and see if there's anything else that we didn't see. Not much. 
much. Mouth parts. <laughs> now I am looking at antenna length. So if I compare the length of the antenna, let's say, to the combination of the head and the pronotum, I'm also going to use the antenna on the right because I think the one on the left is a little broken. That looks better. I'm going to use a ruler on my computer. Give me a moment. Yeah. So I would say that our antenna is about three times the length of the head and the pronotum combined. Um, let's see. Admittedly, I think my, pronot my pronotum is just a little bit long in comparison to the one that, to it, what it is in real life. So I'm just going to kind of pull the, imagine the um, antenna pulled back over its body. And it looks like the antenna would go down to maybe where the middle and the hind legs. Like, right about there. All right, so I've got the first lines and now I'm going to go on either side. Now these um, antenna now these antenna you don't have to do each one of those in segments individually because as you saw there are so many segments. Yeah that was really I'm having a hard time doubling this line. Give me one moment. My pencils are giving me a hard time today. Silly pencils. We're going to switch over to this one. All right, long and thin. And then you can go back in and give it a whole bunch of segments. And luckily, you don't even have to worry about counting them. Just make sure that there is a whole bunch of them. And depending on how the light hits your antenna, you may see the whole line across, or you may see some of just the little um, separations, or uh, just a little bit. So you can go ahead and kind of, they don't have to be perfect, is what I'm trying to say. Um, right about where the, uh, the, the line that I'm going to follow goes over the legs, I'm going to preemptively erase those regions so that I don't have to worry about fixing it, and then I will redraw those. I will resketch any locations that I erased and didn't need to be erased, but it's better to have it erased first in, in my experience. All right. pretty happy with our stonefly here. I gave it little labial, um, little maxillary pulps, and these will be the labial pulps. 
Yeah. He gave he has mouth fingers. Yay. All right. So that is our that's our sketch for the day. Do we have any questions about stoneflies in general or anywhere else on our specimen that we want to look closer at? I'll go ahead and see if I can find a centipede, and if I can't find a centipede in my house, I'll collect a red, um, a red stone centipede, and hopefully it will be fresh enough that we'll be able to sketch it new underneath the microscope. I think that that should work. stoneflies will lay their eggs kind of on plant material that's over the water so that when the eggs hatch the babies kind of just fall into the water um some of them will lay and i also believe some of them lay their eggs um in like clusters that float on the top of the water surface different stoneflies and they all lay their eggs differently. I just read another source that said that they lay their eggs directly into the water, right? So whether or not those eggs float on top of the water or whether they go down into the water, I'm not sure. Um, but it's a whole bunch in different ways. And what do the naiads eat? I know it was discussed in your video about aquatic jobs. Yes! So, um... The naiads are going to be eating a whole bunch of variety of different things. Um, so sometimes our, uh, and it just depends on what species we're looking at, sometimes our stoneflies are predatory, meaning they are going to be going out and eating other insects. Sometimes they are grazers, so they, so every now and again you'll have a species of stonefly that spends its time grazing on plants on rocks, like um, algae and things that are growing on the rocks. And other times we have stoneflies, and I believe most stoneflies are shredders, and they're going to be the guys that are taking the big chunks of leaves and breaking them down into smaller chunks of leaves. So um, some are some so some eat dead plant material, some eat living plant material, and some eat other insects. Stoneflies do have a variety of different jobs depending on their families, um, but um, I think I used stoneflies as one of the examples in, yes, in my aquatic jobs video. So you can always go and check that out. Super appreciated. Alrighty. So uh, we are live streaming every night in October. Thank you so much, everyone who has joined me here today for Thursday. Tomorrow we're going to be ink, uh, doing ink line again. That is going to be a good time. We'll probably do two or three as long as I'm feeling good. Um, and then on Saturday, we will be spreading Death's Head Sphinx Moths again. Um, just to let you know, Monday night you're going to meet my cats and you're going to learn their trick. It's going to be awesome. Hopefully they aren't camera shy, but I think that they will do a great job. I have faith in them. So, um, thank you so much. We I also teach on a platform called OutSchool. OutSchool is a platform where I can teach students ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12, all about different types of insects. I'm also starting an insect um, collecting class um, for how to collect and start your own collection, like how to collect and how to pin. Um, so that is great. Um... This right here is my YouTube channel. You can come and make
make sure that you subscribe obviously those of you who are here are already subscribed so thank you so much that right there is a QR code so that if you would like and you've learned something today you really enjoyed hanging out today you are chat super chatty um, feel free to join feel free to go ahead and donate to Insectopia I do use that money towards Insectopia stuff like keeping my collection nice and getting um, new uh, sketching materials um, so thank you so much for all of you who have hung out if you are looking for me on social media and you look up at Insectopia and you can't find me it's because you need the 2015 in there Facebook and Instagram I am at 20 Insectopia 2015 thank you so much for hanging out with me today um, Hashi and Chaos and Susan I absolutely love seeing you guys here and answering all of your questions so thank you for supporting me and being here um Feel free to reach out with any questions or buggy pictures that you have. Have a wonderful night and stay buggy.